All right, everyone, I've got 12.05 is the time, so we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, first of all, thank you for joining us today uh, for our September virtual forum. You know, it's hard for us to, to keep doing these online. I know many of us would like to be in person, um, but we appreciate you sticking through with us as, you know, we work to still offer these programs. Um, so before we hop into it, I do have a few uh, things I'd like to share about Partners. Of course, if you aren't familiar with Partners, we are a nonprofit organization here in Scott County. Um, we are focused on improving the health of our watersheds and reducing flooding um, by offering education, technical guidance, and volunteer opportunities. Um, and so some of these different activities that we do um, are, of course, these forums. So there's this one, of course, today, and there's another one next month. Um, that's going to be all about landscaping for water quality improvement. So make sure you save the date for that one. And then we do have our fall snapshot coming up um, just two weeks away. And that's our big day where we go out and we uh, monitor water quality throughout the whole county. So we're still looking for volunteers for that. So if you're available, please do check it out. Uh, help us out. You get free donuts and coffee and a t-shirt and pizza. So what more can you really want, right? Um, and we can't do this, of course, without our partners. So thank you to those um, who are listening today, who are involved with our partnering organizations. And if you are interested in becoming a partner, we have many different options for you. Um, all of these are outlined on our website as well. You can also email us if you're interested and would like to learn more. Finally, um, we have test strips uh, for nitrogen available thanks to Iowa Corn. Uh, they donated some that we are happily sending out to anybody who is interested in testing for nitrates and nitrites on their property. Um, we can also help you out in reading these and analyzing the results. So if you are interested in that, go ahead and just send us an email and we'd be happy to get that going for you. So that is my quick spiel. And before um, I turn it over, I'll give Mark a, a moment here. We'd like to take a moment just to kind of introduce our, our speaker for today. So Mark Miller is the deputy director for Scott County Conservation Board um, and serves as the project manager for the Lake of the Hills renovation project. Um, he also supervises the maintenance, law enforcement, and operations for the Conservation Board. So clearly a busy man, and we appreciate him taking the time to, to share this information with us today. Um, he is very knowledgeable thanks to his experience and his degree in fisheries and wildlife biology, um, and has been with Scott County Conservation since 2011. So if there's anything I missed out, feel free to, to talk about yourself there, Mark. We'd love to. Love to hear more about you. And of course this project, I'll go ahead um, and turn this over. One last thing though, we are recording this presentation so it can be found on our YouTube page later. And if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please enter those into the Q&A box and we'll take some time at the end to answer those. All right, Mark, it's all you. All right, I think everybody should be able to see my slides now. I'd like to thank Kelsey for that introduction, and I'd like to thank all of you out there online, all 32 of you, for your interest in this project. So just one minor correction. I've been with Scott County Conservation since 2001. Next month will be my 20th year, and on the 8th, I will be retiring, and there'll be an open house on the 7th. So... Uh, you can always email the conservation board and we'll give you the details on the open house on the afternoon of the, uh, the 7th. And since I work for a conservation agency, we believe in recycling. And so for those of you that have seen this, the other versions or my other talks uh, on the Lake Restoration Project, you'll notice that I did recycle some slides. So I will fly through quite a few of them. Uh, of course, you have to have an obligatory agenda 
And these are kind of the four areas that I'm going to talk about. Uh, Lost Grove, for everyone's knowledge, is a DNR area. It is not a county conservation area. It's not my area, so I'm not going to talk about Lost Grove. Uh, if you know a little bit, we have to do terrain orientation. Being a retired military guy, terrain orientation is always important. And this is kind of Westlake in a nutshell. Uh, you can read through the details. One of the things that I would like to note, uh, there are quite a few disc golfers in the area. We do have a championship level course. It is one of the best in the state. Uh, and in 2017, we hosted the World Disc Golf Championship. So Westlake does draw people from not only all over the United States, but from all over the world. Because when you host the World Disc Golf Championship, you get a lot of people from everywhere. Uh, this is kind of Westlake in the summertime when we have water. We unfortunately don't have a lot of water right now, but we do run the beach, the paddle boats. Uh, we do get particularly a lot of serious bass fishermen when the river's flooded because they don't want to go out and fish in the flooded water, so they come to Westlake. We also do one of the biggest urban trout stocking programs in the state of Iowa. And once we get enough water, we intend to do that again. Uh, we've already ordered the fish. Hopefully we'll have the water by the time the fish are big enough to release. But uh, that little guy on the upper left side, that's what it's all about. The little guy comes out, catches his first trout, his first fish, and we give him a fishing pole at that event. We, we had prizes then, and that's what makes the job worthwhile. We also host a triathlon, and uh, I forget what year it was because I got this gray beard and I, uh, some of the years blend together, but uh, we did host the national championship, so uh, our triathlon is very popular and it's a great sport, so we do get a lot of serious athletes that come to Westlake. This is kind of the park overview. Uh, you can see the trails, the parking lots, uh, our trail emergency system that we have, and then the four lakes that are within West Lake. This is the watershed that we're dealing with, and that if you're doing a lake restoration, that's always important. 1,600 acres with about 40% of it being within the park. There's actually five lakes in the watershed, the fifth one being Lake Kenyatta that is a private lake to the south. So, but that is your watershed. So what was the problem? Why did you do lake restoration? Because we were on Iowa's impaired waters list, the 303D. We had high levels of chlorophyll, suspended algae, water transparency wasn't good, and we had some phosphorus. Uh, but that was kind of associated with a couple different things, one of those being a huge number of grass carp. You can also take a look at it in another, in another way. They made West Lake as part of the I-280 expansion program from 68 to 72. The park opened in 72. It's been 49 years. Typically in Iowa, you do lake restoration in 35 to 50 years. So in other words, it's time. It's just at the age where it needed renovating. So anytime you're going to do this, you need to have an objective. What's your mission? Well, we had two, really. Uh, well, three, if you want to look at it. But one, to get off the 303, the impaired waters list. But you do that by restoring the fishery. With the huge number of grass carp we had, and some of them were big enough to scare you, that we had to get rid of the grass carp, renovate the fishery. If you look at the grass carp, they were essentially like putting a, a mixer in a bathtub and it kept all the nutrients and the algae and everything kept suspended in the water column, uh, which reduced our water transparency. So the, the grass carp were part of the issue. And then being a high use recreational facility, and that's kind of one of our main missions for the public, we wanted to maintain that. So to solve that problem, you, we made a watershed management plan and that was broken down into nine steps. If you look at the ones in blue, those are the ones that we have already accomplished. Uh, the watershed management plan is basically a roadmap to get to the objective. 
So we're down into the implementation phase right now. I'll talk a little bit more in detail on that. Uh, but to get off the, the 303D, the impaired waters list, that requires about 10 to 15 years of water monitoring. So we're, it's, not a, it's not like, hey, we got lake restoration done. We're going to be off the list next year. It doesn't work that way. It requires a number of years of monitoring to see if you do that. So I mentioned that the watershed management plan was kind of a roadmap to get to where we wanted to go. One of the things that we did was we sliced and diced our data. We looked at our watershed. We broke that down by sheet and real erosion, sub watersheds, how much of it was hay in hay, how much was in, in asphalt, how much in houses. Um, we sliced our data a number of different ways to be able to ascertain how to solve the problem and, and whether we're gonna do this technique versus that technique. And there's a variety of those that you can do. Which ones get you the bang for the buck for the budget you have to work with? So we completed the plan and that was the watershed management plan. That was our basic roadmap to get to where we wanted to go. The other thing that we did was we did what's called a TMDL study, which is your total maximum daily load. That is the amount of uh, pollutants that can enter a body of water and still not impact that body of water that your water quality can stay up. So that is a few hundred page document, uh, pretty dry reading, pretty scientific, but guys like me that are fish and wildlife biologists, we get into that kind of stuff. So. That got completed. The other thing that that enabled us to do was if there was any federal money available, we needed that study to qualify for that federal money. So we completed that study. The Iowa DNR, Andrew Prana, he did an exceptional job in a very short period of time. That was a very good timing. We just lucked into that. Uh, he was available. We could put him on the project and he took care of it in about six months. Normally those are two to three year projects. Uh, so Andrew did ours in record time and he did quite a great job at it. Then once we had all that work completed, then we had to do the design and engineer. You gotta, you gotta do that. Uh, a, a project of this magnitude requires a exceptional amount of permitting and engineering. Uh, we use FIRA engineering. Uh, they got the, the proposal on that. And then locally, they use IMAG. Uh, FIRA is out of farther west, and IMAG is local. So that was kind of their eyes and ears on the ground. And then you kind of break it down into those big areas for how you're going to essentially a lake restoration project is like eating an elephant. And you do that one bite at a time and you have to be able to break the, the big project down and those are some of the steps. So and we also, when we went to do the work, we did this in phases. We didn't try and do it all in one big shot. We did it in phase one, phase two. Um, phase one was the watershed work and that was all the stuff that we, in a nutshell, would consider outside the water. Uh, and in doing that, we made five ponds. We had to get water easements, permits are required for the size of construction. You had to do the construction, uh, contract that. We started it in March of 19 and hoped to get it done in that year. Weather delayed us. We got it finished up in the spring of 2020. And that gave us three new ponds and two pond renovations. And I'll talk a little bit about some of that later. And then also a bioswale. Um, if any of you know Jerry Bolt or Dan Reefy, Dan Reefy from Reefy Restaurants, uh, if you know them, a big thank you to those two, because without those two and their support, we could not have done this project, uh, at least not in the manner that we did. Uh, we put ponds on the county land and back water up to their, on their land. So they lost crop production land or hay land and, uh, we got a place to, to park sediment upstream and we'll take care of the dam and they get the pond and the sediment. So in doing that, if you take a look at this, these are the, this is part of the, the watershed protection plan. 
where as you can see on the west and on the south, uh, those are the two ponds where we backed up a lot more water and then we put two other ponds below those. So those are humongous nitrogen and phosphorus dumping locations and you can denitrify the water by running them through there very slowly. And then there's two other ponds in the northeast part that are on uh, our land up above Lombok Lake. Uh, we put a four bay right outside my window here that when we don't have any leaves, I can see the four bay uh, out this window up to the side here. Uh, that wasn't intentional. That just kind of fell out of the plan. So we got a four bay there and then we renovated uh, ponds two and three that it's hard to see the two and three, but those were existing and we renovated those. So uh, that was kind of part of how we put all the watershed in. Then we went to the stuff in the water or in the lakes. And again, we used FIRA and IMAG, primarily FIRA for the engineering. And those are some of the elements that were associated with that. Um, I mentioned the nine ponds, four of them were in phase one, the other four fell out in, in the phase two. Now, as part of our plan, we looked at where people fish, because remember there's a recreational aspect. So we looked at where the anglers could access the water, where they were fishing, what, what the banks were in those particular areas. Um, were they degraded? How much were they degraded? We did an assessment there. And then part of that was how we were gonna put the lake back together. Uh, because you wanna maintain a high use fishing and you also need to stabilize your banks to reduce erosion. The other thing, uh, fishing is a big part of it. So we did quite a bit of habitat. Uh, you can see there's what's called a rock star in the upper left of the diagram. Uh, then we use geotextile matting uh, for bank stabilization and that also provides some fish habitat. Uh, we did a lot of work overall with fish habitat. So I think everybody knows we had emerald ash borer come through our area and it killed the ice trees. We had about 200 of them in high use recreational areas that were either dead or dying. And the lake project came along and that was kind of a good, good use of instead of chopping those trees down and and composting them or burning them, we put them in the lake for fish habitat. So we essentially moved them from the uplands to underwater. And those are what made our brush piles and our fish rock stars and those kind of things. The other thing we did was quite a bit of aquaculture. Uh, I call them fish buckets or buckets. And those you'll see if you come out and drive around West Lake, you'll see white buckets with blue PEX tubing sticking out of them. That is aquaculture. Uh, in North Scott uh, FFA, uh, Corey Engelbrecht, he helped him and his daughter and they helped us out. The Quad City and Fishermen did a lot of buckets. They cut somewhere in the neighborhood of 10,000 feet of PEX for us so we could make the buckets. Uh, West Liberty Foods donated the buckets and then uh, in Fisherman guy named Al Haas, he was instrumental in coordinating that. So those are the people that helped us out there. Then we did a lot of rock piles. Now, the majority of what we did were culvert piles. And uh, Mark Klimek from Linwood Mining was instrumental in helping us get a lot of those. And then the local DOT got us a lot of culverts too. Those came from the I-74 project. So if you look at the, a lot of the culverts in Westlake, they were formerly in Bettendorf under I-74, or maybe from the Illinois side, but the DOT guys collected them, trucked them down to us, we put them in the lake. And then we brought in from Linwood Mining a lot of other culverts so that we could reduce our cost. Uh, so we didn't buy too many rock piles, we only had to buy a few. Uh, but the culverts that were donated were just a fantastic way to save money. And then we had spawning beds in there. And I'll show you another slide here directly where, you know, we, we cut out uh, deep troughs in the lake bottom. And then we made like little, little benches in there and rock the tops of them and put rocks on the sides. And all that is for fish habitat. And 
when you look at it, you may not understand it, but if you're a fish guy, you fish biologist, fish habitat guy, you do understand that. And Chad Dolan is our supporting DNR biologist. Chad worked with us uh, tons of hours to come up with this design. And so Chad has done lake renovations all over Southeast Iowa. So he knows what he's doing and we believe we had a great project. So this is kind of, these aren't necessarily pictures from Westlake, but they're, they're notional pictures that show you how a rock star, the trees sticking out in that pattern where it, you have it high, you have it cut down, uh, that provides a lot of area for the fish to live. The bottom left is what I call an aquaculture or a fish bucket. And then there's stake beds, and then some of the other ones show how you use rock shoals and things like that to provide fish habitat. Now, fish is one thing that a lot of people like to talk about because that's part of our recreation out here. So you can see the four things that we had to do, and, and number four, they're desirable fish species. So those are the fish that we are putting in, minus I don't have a picture of a red ear up there, but uh, restoring the fishery is extremely important. So here are the species that we're putting in, bluegill, red ears, channel cat, largemouth, and black crappie. We are not gonna let you, you come out to Westlake and use minnows for bait because that has too high a probability of inter introducing a rough fish into the waters and rough fish are what we don't wanna have. So this mix of of fish for our geographical area has been very successful. We're confident it'll do well. People ask us about, well, are you gonna put in walleye? Are you gonna put in perch or whatever? And the answer is no, because they won't do well in Westlake. So it's not the right lake for those species. So these are the species that we're gonna have in Westlake and we're gonna stock them. And some of the ponds and stuff have already been stocked. So, uh, that's the direction we're going, and those are the species that we're going to have. And by the way, it's illegal to introduce any other fish into our waters. So, you know, a lot of times people think they know more than the fish biologist and, and, the guy, and those of us that do this stuff for a living, but they really don't. It's these, this list of fish will do well at Westlake. It's what we need. We don't need anything else, and we don't need any help. So when I talked about the design, you can see on here that you can see the cuts, you can see the elevations, you can see where we put the brush piles. Um, it's all part of the master plan with the bank stabilization, the riprap along the, the banks, that the, the larger riprap gives crayfish uh, a place to hide. It, it all relates together with how we're putting, how we put the fishery back together. And then like in the example of Blue, Bluegrass Lake, it never had a drain. Now we have a tower with it. We have a drain in it. We have ability to control the water level in it. We can lower it if we need to do maintenance, um, which was a real benefit. We had never had one of those in the past. It was just a culvert under the highway. This is Railroad Lake. Now, you can see the line running through Ra Railroad Lake, kind of sort of uh, about a third from the left. That from there to the west is primarily where we dredged it out and deepened it because the other part of the lake is fairly deep water. Uh, the four bay is down to the south. And then uh, <clears throat> there's a channel that runs through there for essentially to drain it. And railroad has a, a tower with a drain in it. Uh, so the, app, the goal in all of our lakes when we get done, because we didn't dredge everything. You just basically, you can't afford to do it. You have to stabilize the banks where you can. Uh, but the goal was an average depth of eight to 10 feet overall in all four of the lakes. So that was kind of what we were working for. That was the objective. And so in railroad, you know, we got it, we, we dredged out about a third of it. And then that went into a spoil site. But to dredge it all the 35 foot deep or whatever, that's just cost prohibitive. Now, what were some other changes that we did? Well, 
since we didn't have any water in the lakes, we said, well, you know, our boat ramps aren't in too good a shape. They're not bad, but they're not in real good shape. So why don't we go ahead and put in new boat ramps at both gate one and two? We did that. Uh, we made a great ADA fishing pier and put an accessible sidewalk and everything down there at gate two. And you can see the pictures there. I would encourage everyone to come out and take a look at that. Uh, RDA and SCRA helped donate money to that. Uh, the Isaac Waltons did some. Uh, you can see that the lower left picture were a little bit starved for grass. I mean, summer hasn't been real good to us to try to get anything to grow back for seeding. But that ADA fishing pier, I think everybody will like that. Uh, we do have fish buckets and, and fish structure around there. So I'm sure that that's going to be a great fishing spot in the out years. The other thing we're going to do down on the beach is called, I call it a wibbit. And it's uh, basically it's an inflatable recreational toy that goes out in the water. Uh, these are notional. Uh, that won't be our actual design. Our actual design is different. But the way they put it in a PDF, I couldn't lift it out of it to show you exactly what we're getting. But it'll be floating out in the lake um, at the beach in Westlake, because, you know, you can't just go swim anywhere in Westlake. You can only swim in the beach. Um, but that Wibbit will be down there and then it's broken into two section, two sections. There's a big section for larger kids and a smaller section for little kids. And so then when you come to visit the beach at Westlake, you can go swim, you can play on the Wibbit, you can rent a paddle boat, you can rent kayaks, we have fishing boats, so you, uh, there's, and a concession down there, so there's quite a bit you can do for recreational activities when you're at Westlake. Now, where are we at right now? Well, the lakes are filling up. We had valve inspections last week. So we got a little bit of work to do on a couple of valves and then uh, the other valves are closed and we just need rain and snow to fill up. That's kind of it. I know I get questions on how people ask me, how are you gonna fill it up? Well, I'm not gonna fill it up. God's gonna fill it up because I can't make it rain and I can't make it snow. And there's not like a spigot or a hose you can do to fill up the lake. I mean, we're talking roughly 100 acres of water. Uh, so it'll fill up, nature will fill that up. Um, we have the majority of the pond stocked already. Once we get sufficient water, we will stock the rest of the ponds uh, <clears throat> and the lakes. So, but you need, enough water depth to carry those fish over the winter. If we get some good rains in September, we should be stocking fish in October. If the rains don't come, then we'll be stocking fish in the spring. So the answer on when are you gonna stock fish is it all depends. Um, you tell me what the weather's gonna be and how much rain we're gonna get, and I'll tell you when we can stock fish. So the other thing that we're doing right now is we're finishing up all of the seeding the final grading, final seeding. Uh, that'll be put in with a cover crop. And then this fall, the conservation staff will go in and plant prairie grass <clears throat> in about 20 different acres that we have. Uh, part of that'll be the spoil site across from gate one. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Service donated some money and is buying us just strictly Forbes so that we can go forb heavy. We're gonna use the Leopold mix for native prairie grasses, um, supplement that with money from the Fish and Wildlife Service. And then also Fish and Wildlife's giving us uh, some additional milkweed seed. So we're doing a lot of stuff for the birds and the bees and the butterflies here. And hopefully that will come back out uh, or grow well. I mean, if you come out to Westlake in the next two or three years, you're going to say, boy, that looks like a lot of weeds. But if you understand native grass prairies, it takes th two, three, four, five years to get a good prairie, prairie established. So the first few years, it looks a little rough around the edges, but it'll get there. Then we've got to put in the webbing anchors so that we can, uh, it's easier to put those in when you don't have water. Uh, so hopefully we'll get those in before the water comes up, but you never know what's going to happen. 
then we are planning on opening the beach for Memorial Day weekend next year and, and having the rental facilities open and the Wibbits up and hopefully we'll have enough water depth and everything will be rocking and rolling then. And we have already agreed to host a triathlon next June, Father's Day weekend. And then as with any project, we'll continue to monitor the water and we will continue to make improvements here at Westlake. So in a nutshell, I know I kind of went a little fast over a lot of the slides, but I think some of those people had seen before. If you have more questions, there's the contact information. As I said, I'm going to be retiring, so don't email me. I won't, you know, a couple of weeks from now, I'll be gone. So <clears throat> with that, I will turn it back over to the moderator, Kelsey, and field any questions that people have. And I do appreciate your interest in our project. All right, thanks for sharing all that, Mark. And uh, congrats on almost retiring. <laughs> I'll give people some time to enter any questions they may have, um, but I did see some come through in the chat. Um, this one we had was curious if you had any pictures of uh, that scary grass carp that was found. <laughs> uh, probably, I would just have to dig those out. I don't think it's uh, anything I could dig out quick enough and, and share quickly. I know I have one of them on my phone, but it's on my phone and not, not available. But the stocking records indicated that from 1979 to 1980, they stocked approximately 1,200 grass carp. And back then the biology was that they won't reproduce, they'll die, they'll have a high mortality rate and those kind of things. Uh, what we found out was they live a long time and their mortality, their mortality rate is relatively low. So those fish stocked in 79 and 80, you know, they were 40, 45 years old, whatever the math. I mean, they were big. So we used to feed them. I used to go down on, on the dock there, the deck at, at the lake and feed them popcorn. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. So. All right, maybe. Maybe that's what turned them big and scary. It's all that popcorn. <laughs> um, we did get another question here. Curtis wants to know, will it take a few years for the fish to get huge and plentiful? Yeah, typically on a lake restoration project like this, when you put the fish in initially, the first two to three years, they grow at a phenomenal rate uh, because there's they're not at carrying capacity yet. And so... Uh, Say if you stock them this year, being 21, 24, 25, fishing will be fantastic here. So like your, your largemouth, uh, if you stock them one year in a new project, they can gain a pound, a pound and a half a year. So put them in a one year, two years, three years later, they're three pounders. So it'll, they'll grow fast, it'll work, it'll work good. And then with the sunfish and the red ears, those grow relatively fast anyway. So two years, you should be catching some pretty decent bluegills. The crappie, crappie are cyclic fish, so that's going to take a little longer, um, you know, four or five years for the crappie. But yeah, fishing in three to four years here at Westlake is going to be phenomenal. Once we get water, we have to get the water first. All right, I know where Curtis will be in a couple couple years. Um, another question we got here is, are you stocking the new small ponds with fish in addition to the established lakes? Yes. Uh, I would have to think a minute. And the four bay was stocked last year. So that's already done. Um, the two ponds above Lombok are done. And the two ponds butting up on private ground are done. And then there are several of the ponds that we renovated and that will not hold fish. So those won't get stocked. 
So those are like the ones uh, immediately adjacent to bluegrass and the one by, below the campground. Those are more uh, nitrogen phosphorus denitrification type sediment ponds. So they're not really designed for fishing. They're designed to help water quality and then raise wood ducks and frogs. That's, I mean, I went back to the one the other day and there were like 15 wood ducks came off of it. And I'm like, that's really cool. So there, even though it may not be a fish holding pond or a fishing pond, there is still a huge immense value in that. So that's kind of part of the overall design. But yeah, we've already stocked the, the smaller ponds. That's awesome. I'll have to get out there and see the wood ducks. Um, got some more questions coming in. Um, said, I believe remnants of Telegraph Road were visible in the Lake of the Hills when it was drained. Were there any other interesting finds? The, I mean, everybody thought when we drained the lake that we'd find cars and safes and all that kind of stuff. And <clears throat> basically, no. Yeah, you could see the old Telegraph Road Bridge and, and some of the old roadway. The, the other thing that people don't really know is that the sewer system at Westlake crosses the lake three different times. So some of those were not part of the Telegraph Road. That was the sewer system. And we built the dirt up on top of that sewer system and then rocked the top of it for habitat and then put bigger rocks along the edges. And that's for habitat. But some of that wasn't the road. Some of that is our sewer system that we have. Uh, but then, yes, some of it was the road. And you could see the old bridge. The other thing that people aren't aware of is when they made Westlake down towards the gate one boat ramp and, and that northeastern part and along the point, there were junkyards. So there was an old junkyard. And back in those days, they didn't remove all of that or bury all of that. They just flooded it. So there were people that were digging around in the mud down there thinking they were finding great things. And it's like, yeah, you're digging in a 1960s junkyard there. So that's, that's part of it. So, but no, we really, other than, you know, some of the interesting things in the old bottles and stuff that came out of the junkyard, uh, we didn't find cars, skeletons, safes, Found a bunch of old fishing lures, but that was about it. I'm to hear no secret uh, treasures, but probably for the best. Um, have another question. Why didn't the park obtain Lake Kenyatta? I don't know if I'm saying that right. Why didn't we buy Lake Kenyatta? Is that the question? Yeah. Money. When you're doing a multi-million dollar, multi-year project in the lake, it's really hard to come up with more to buy any other land. That's, you know, great idea, but uh, you just can't, can't get there from here. Funding. If only you would have found that secret treasure chest. Yeah, <laughs> that's safe full of money. It wasn't there. <laughs> Uh, all right, some more questions. How many acres have you converted to pollinator habitat and are there plans to do more? And um, a separate question, but similar, is who will maintain those prairie plantings? Well, the maintenance part of it isn't too hard because we have a staff here at Westlake that can maintain that. And we already, <clears throat> we already have like a 20 acre patch on the Northeastern part that we, we maintain and, and then, uh, there's about 15 acres to the north of Railroad Lake that it, it could use a little bit of renovation and stuff. It's older prairie. Um, we're putting in about 20 to 24 new acres of prairie. Um, and that's not all contiguous. That's in a variety of places around the park. But where we could go ahead and take and switch it over to prairie, 
the spoil sites, 10 to 12 acres, depending on how you measure it. Um, some of the areas where we had to take fill and that, uh, those are all going back into native grass plantings and not, not back into mode type grass. And so overall, when we get done, there'll be roughly, probably 50, 60 acres of, of prairie grass here at Westlake out of the 600 and some we have. And then you got about a hundred in water. Um, so we'll do that. And then, you know, staff can maintain that. They love to get out there and burn prairie. That's awesome. Uh, one last question I'm seeing in here. Are surrounding landowners using um, extra careful practices to avoid detrimental runoff coming into the lakes? We try to do that. And Kelsey's predecessor, one, she worked with us and she met with the homeowners associations in that in the neighborhood, uh, particularly to the west side and everything where the watershed goes. So yes, we've done some public meetings um, some educational type things and tried to elicit their support. But, you know, the thing is, they're private landowners and they may or may not listen. And, you know, you try to get voluntary support out of that. Um, you know, like I said before, uh, Jerry Bolt, the farmer to the west, and Dave Reefy, one of the landowners to the west and the north, uh, those guys were critical to helping us out and, and letting us do temper or permanent easements on their land and flood their land forever. And, you know, that's huge in trying to, to, to get a project of this um, done and then how that works into your numbers that you're looking for to reduce nitrogen and phosphorus. But as far as the other landowners, yeah, we're trying. We're gonna we're gonna get Kelsey out there, and she's gonna go to some more homeowner and homeowner association meetings and stuff. So that's the outreach education that comes into this. Sounds great. Um, I'm not seeing. Any more questions in the chat? I'll give folks just another minute here. I am seeing lots of happy retirement. So. Lots of people appreciate, appreciative of um, your time and the information that you shared today. I thank you again, Mark, and thank you everyone for participating. If you have any other questions, you can email partners or you can email um, Mark and we can get those questions answered for you. So thank you all again. Uh, we hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you for having me.